For us in 2015, when we woke up to find ourselves at war, we had three choices. Slow down, shut down, or adapt and continue business as usual. Welcome to Radio Davos, the podcast from the World Economic Forum that looks at the biggest challenges and how we might solve them. This week, as conflict in the Middle East reminds us all of the horror of war, we take a look at another war zone where civil war has blighted lives for the last eight years and ask, how does business continue to operate and supply vital goods such as food in somewhere like Yemen? Yemeni businesses are responsible for a significant part of the economy in in Yemen. We import approximately 85% of all food into Yemen. The head of this Yemeni food business explains how even in a war zone, business is vital for people. There are strong, resilient partners, merchants, shops, small business owners, large business owners in these communities who actually go the extra mile to save lives. And this multinational describes the challenges of supplying goods to a war-torn country. Normally in supply chain you plan for your manufacturing and it's a system, but here it's completely unpredictable. Which route can you take into Yemen? Which border is open today? And then you hope that they make it through. Subscribe to Radio Davos wherever you get your podcasts or visit weft.ch slash podcast where you'll also find Meet the Leader and Agenda Dialogues. I'm Robin Pomeroy at the World Economic Forum and with this look at how private sector companies can continue to do vital work in a war zone like Yemen. For us as private sector, it's very difficult to operate in fragile states. This is Radio Davos. Welcome to Radio Davos and an episode that we had planned and recorded many months ago before the attacks by Hamas on Israel and Israel's military response in the Gaza Strip. That conflict has been raging for months and has drawn in other countries, including the one that is the focus of this episode, Yemen. But even before those recent events, Yemen, a country on the southern tip of the Arabian Peninsula, had been in a state of civil war since 2014. The toll on the people is enormous, with 17 million, more than half the total population, unable to get the food they need, according to the UN World Food Programme. We wanted to see how private companies, particularly those delivering vital things such as food, can continue to operate in a war zone. And my colleague Nikki Rowe set out to do that. She talked to two companies working there, Tetra Pak, the Swedish-based multinational that's known around the world for its food and beverage packaging. Um, Tetra Pak supplies packaging and packaging machinery to Yemen and to companies that operate in Yemen. We'll hear from them later. First, she spoke to Mohammed Nabil Hayel Sayed. Said, a senior executive at Yemen's HSA Group, a family-run private sector company involved in food distribution. Nikki started by asking him what that company HSA is. We first opened our doors in 1938 in a very small city in the port of Aden, southern Yemen. And 85 years later, the family business has grown to what it is today, one of the largest family-based businesses in the Middle East, employing around 35,000 globally with operations from Southeast Asia to most of Africa, the Middle East, and and the UK. The family business always adopted a values-led approach to sustainable growth and uh, set by the values of of doing well by doing good. So as a family business, we are built on family values, values of care, compassion, and community-minded spirit. And and we've practiced those in both the, the good times and the troubled times. I'm a family member myself and a Yemeni myself. I've seen the impact that family businesses have on communities, have on economies. And so across the years, I've seen how the family and the wider private sector has on millions of people in developed markets, but equally in developing markets such as Yemen and other fragile conflict states. How has Yemen changed since you've been working in the business? The country went through many different waves of challenges, good times and and also very troubled times. But specifically, there is a lot of crises in the world today. The economic crisis and the food security crisis is a major component of that. Today we talk when eight out of 10 Yemenis are in dire need of some sort of humanitarian assistance. But also for us as private sector, it's, it's very difficult to operate in fragile states. Operating in these types of situations, uh, we as private sector, as family businesses, face unique challenges. Political stability and security, in many cases, are, are not there. And then you have a very poor infrastructure. You don't have a reliable access to electricity. Roads in which you use to distribute food to major staples 
to remote communities, to villages are not sufficient. They're damaged because of the conflict. And then you have the human capital. There's a lack of skills in the labor market. Schools are being damaged because of the conflict. According to the UNICEF, the country today has 2 million children who are not going to school. So there is challenges. And to top it off, you have a currency that lost four-fifths of its value against the U.S. dollar. And then the impact of rising costs of the global food prices. Just before the conflict in Ukraine, the prices was already a 10-year high. So we we end up needing to juggle between all of these challenges that are not in other stable markets. How do you conduct business? Can you tell us of any sort of specific incident that you can think of or walk us through a day of supply chain challenges just because most people will they'll never conceive of working in situations such as this in in some way we are we operate like a humanitarian organization we work with everyone we're neutral and we try to focus on the communities making sure food is is being reached to to the last mile we're all about advocating for food security economic development and so we we make sure we work along partners to deliver what we do. There is an Arabic saying that says one hand doesn't clap. And so it really takes partners with you to work with us. And one of these is, is Tetra Pak, which we're proud of our partnership with Tetra Pak on a range of issues, but most recently on the school feeding program. I mean, we recently have done a consumer market study on the Yemeni consumer and wanted to understand and get a feeling about the real challenges people are facing on the ground. We want to make sure we're deeply connected to the communities and we listen to what they're facing. And one of those respondents told us that, when I quote is, prices have risen horribly this year. One stopped all luxuries. And the thing that worries me the most is that one does not have savings in case of sickness. So people are really facing choices between feeding themselves or saving for moments of medical situations. Another lady told us that instead of what we used to buy in large quantities, now we're buying the smallest packages. And she goes and and says, I say, give me the cheapest type. We don't care about quality anymore. So the choices and the consumer behavior changes in these markets. And we try to listen to these and see how we can adapt our product to match these needs. And one of them was re-looking and revisiting our packaging solutions to make sure we're offering small quantities of food, but packed rather than loose, which the consumer is going towards. That's very interesting. Is that the first time that you've done a study like that? I mean, were any of the findings from that surprising or were they all sort of what you'd anticipated? Some of them was obviously clear for us that people in times of crisis, they go through this decision-making process of prioritizing their necessities versus the, the luxuries, which was understandable. But what was for us concerning is that people went beyond this and they started risking their own health versus what they were are able to afford. And they were saying that fine, we're going to go for the cheapest, the non-healthy, and try to survive. So these are difficult situations, but that inside allowed us to produce new products and packaging in the market. So we were able to react to these insights and to be able to make sure that we offer these types of products to the people. And have you had feedback that it's had an impact? We started rolling out the the product a few months ago, and, and we started seeing some very positive reactions from these communities. We had to also go on an awareness campaign, educating people that this is smaller packed, more healthier than loose products and so on. And so it's it's a journey, but we saw a very positive uptake from there. When it comes to your employees, I mean, I imagine that your company would rely heavily on local knowledge to direct support to the most vulnerable. How do you find out about these regions and how quickly can you mobilize to get them? As HSA operating in Yemen, we are deeply, deeply connected to the country, deeply connected to the communities. We've been faithfully serving these communities for 85 years. So we have established presence in the market, established networks across the country. We've made 
structure that we continue to operate through this conflict. And what we usually do is we partner with the regions in the country in which there are traders and merchants there. And so it's more of a partnership between the big businesses, but also the medium and small businesses, because these small and, and medium businesses are the ones who are present on the ground in these villages, in these towns. And we made sure that we stay connected. We have access to around 70,000 outlets in all across the, the country. And so uh, we made sure to get these out there. Oh, but also specifically in, in the conflict, there are moments where communities or small villages have been completely disconnected from the local economy because of either the road has been damaged uh, due to the conflict or it's in the middle of a, a war zone. And so in these moments, the private sector would actually work with local communities to rebuild these roads, to resurface them, and to get them connected back into the local economy. So that's a moment where the private sector is going a little bit out of focusing on only making profits, but rather trying to lead a more purpose-driven approach to getting uh, these communities back connected into the economy. So across the years, we've we've managed to 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 rebuild or to resurface over 140 roads and, and getting back these disconnected villages back into the economy and servicing them. Given that, how do you sort of support your employees? How do you describe the, the myriad of challenges and the uncertainty that your employees would face? One employee was telling us once, his name is Hashim Ahmed. He handles the transportation of goods from Taiz, a small city in Yemen, to Al Mahra, another city. And he takes products from the factory and transports it to another city. And this is a long journey. It's eight days up to 13 days, depending on the road, depending on the security and so on. And what he was telling us, one is that I do work, but this is also humanitarian work. So as an organization, the employees have been driven significantly by the, the purpose and they're actually doing humanitarian work. Unlike maybe other markets where they will be driven by meeting sales targets or different types of KPIs, we have people here who are going the extra mile because they believe that they're doing humanitarian work. So one is we have employees who are real heroes on the ground, who we're very proud of, who are going that extra mile. Secondly, is that as an organization, we make sure that these employees are very well looked after in terms of salaries. We are the largest private employer in the whole country. And we made sure that we stay committed to our 20,000 employees only in Yemen. And so making sure their health insurance is there, their salaries are uninterrupted, their incentives are not interrupted, but most importantly, also their self-development. So we've worked with SAP to launch their first ever young uh, professional training program in the whole country in Yemen. And we've delivered two batches of that for the first time SAP in Yemen. We also partnered with Cisco to try to launch technology uh, hubs in the country in partnership with local universities in the country. So we want to make sure that we incentivize and to further develop our employees, but also the wider labor market in the country. And then finally, we launched a few other programs inside HSA Group, specifically for our employees' well-being, making sure that they balance between the work and their life and making sure we're giving them a space in which they can express any of their concerns they face doing that work. What has your job taught you about human nature? There must be sort of a sense of fatigue after such a prolonged conflict, but food is essential, infrastructure is essential. And I mean, is there anything you could say about human nature that you've, you've learned particularly from the people doing these jobs? So it's been around nine miserable years in the country. It's difficult for people, it's difficult for businesses and for everyone operating there. And we continue to learn every day. But what I can say is that we learned that we cannot thrive alone. As businesses and, and in the country, they can thrive if communities can thrive. We can thrive as HSA, for example, if our local communities do not thrive. And we want to make sure that people can now shift their approach into recovery, reconstruction, 
and rebuilding the country and, and getting the country back into a journey to prosperity. But also, they say it's, it's in only in moments of crisis where one's values are truly put to the test. For us in 2015, when we woke up to find ourselves at war, we had three choices, slow down, shut down, or adapt and continue business as usual. And these are three difficult decisions as a business you, you need to take. We've seen some businesses in the country stepping out and, and shutting down. But as Yemen's largest business, we chose a, a different decision, is to really adapt and to continue business as usual, because for us, that was the only guarantee that the people will be fed. And so what we learned from our experience is that businesses need to prioritize long-term returns versus short-term or quick gains. And for us as a business, our focus is not for the immediate short-term profits, but rather staying with communities committed to them in the good time and the bad times in hopes for the long-term uh, return. We're deeply connected to not only in Yemen, to the communities uh, we, we, we work, and we believe that long-term perspective to doing business has been an integral role. And so that is one of the key learning is prioritize long-term return versus short-term uh, gains and, and making sure you're able to adapt uh, to the situation uh, as well and, and working in partnership with your international organizations and as well your corporate partners such as our friends at Tetra Pak who have been working uh, and who have been standing with us shoulder to shoulder throughout this difficult uh, situation in the country. I mean, given that this is sadly called the Forgotten War, I mean, is there any organization or group or location that is particularly memorable that you'd like to mention so we can shine a bit of a spotlight on it? Yemen is a very colorful country. It's very rich. It's very diverse. It's an interesting geography. It has many beautiful places either in the coastal line, a small island called Socotra in Yemen, or in the northern part of the country, an old city that goes back to 3,000 year old. Uh, people still live in there, uh, shops are open and people operate. So there's a lot of interesting historical uh, places in the country. The people are very resilient and this conflict has shown us the resilience of the Yemeni people and the resilience of the Yemeni private sector throughout this conflict. So yeah, we hope that eventually the uh, the country will find its way for peace and people are able to, to operate on their uh, daily job. Countries in crisis are often, they're the, the worst and most impacted by, by things like climate change. And, you know, how do you focus on sustainable development goals while you're operating in a prolonged civil war i mean do you or is it would imagine sometimes it's just your hands are sort of tied and you have to make a decision and have you noticed an impact of climate change in yemen and on its communities and have you been able to make any changes to your business to to address them Definitely. I mean, more broadly, the UN Sustainable Development Goals plays an integral role in the work we do. And I believe it can be done in, in any setting. Uh, ending poverty is, is one of the major UN Development Sustainable Goals, and uh, ending hunger. And one of the key work we're doing is advocating for food security and making sure the country remains fed, making sure there is an uninterrupted supply of goods into the country, making sure that we're working with international organizations to support the food security and really trying to march towards end of hunger. So one of our key focuses and work in the UN SDGs is, is to try and hunger, but also developing Yemen's infrastructure, making sure that we are able to create jobs in the country and, and to employ people and to upskill these people. And so that's one of the key work we're doing. But also Yemen is threatened by the scarcity of water. There has been drought and some of our facilities has been adapted to become more conscious about waste water management. And, and so we've adapted uh, our environmental practices in some of these uh, plants. And one of our plants is now being run by 70% solar, making sure that we utilize that source that is available in Yemen. But also beyond just 
businesses. We've seen the Yemeni consumer, the Yemeni communities shifting from generators and electricity that is powered by the government, which was cut off due to the conflict. People had to choose other means for electricity. And one of the major source of energy into Yemeni communities is solar panels. So now if you just go and, and, and stand on top of a long building in Sana'a or Yemen and, and you just see Yemen with, with panels, which doesn't sound for many that would be possible in a country like Yemen, but people adapted and, and people saw that they were able to, to use solar to give them energy. Is there anything else that you'd like to say while, while I've got you? I mean, I think I could talk all day. I would like just to share two more things. For those who may not be aware, Yemeni businesses are responsible for a significant part of the economy in a country. Uh, we play, as private sector, a major role in Yemen. We import approximately 85% of all food in, into Yemen. We work with humanitarian or agencies to supply them with wheat, but also work with them in terms of importing, storing their foods and working with them to distribute those to, to the local communities. And as the private sector is the major source of income for a lot of Yemeni people across the country. And so we want people to understand the role of the private sector, not only in Yemen, but the role of the private sector in fragile and conflict states and how local legitimacy and local scale and infrastructure of the private sector and also their commitment to the country is there. And the Yemeni private sector has proven an inspiring story and a story of a nation's courage, resilience, and, and potential. And now what we want and what we're advocating with our international community partners, uh, that the country needs a shift from aid to trade. We want to get the country back into a path towards a prosperity and redevelopment and making sure that the country will not continue forever on aid, but rather than self-develop and supporting the country through a recovery process. And that's what we want to work with our international partners toward. And finally, I would maybe end by saying that every time we fail to find solutions to these challenges, whether global or local challenges, the most vulnerable in our societies are really hit the hardest. And so we can be talking about macroeconomic fancy things, but at the end of the day, there are bread and butter issues people on the ground face. And we want to stay focused on helping household by household, community by community, and, and seeing how we can alleviate the sufferings of so many people in the country. But also know that there are strong, resilient partners, merchants, shops, small business owners, large business owners in these communities who actually go the extra mile to save lives. Mohamed Nabil Hayel Saeed of Yemen's HSA Group. Also working in Yemen is multinational Tetra Pak. Nikki spoke to the managing director at Tetra Pak Arabia, Niels Hugard. I represent Tetra Pak Arabia, so we operate in, in 12 countries in the Middle East. We have manufacturing sites in Jeddah, where we produce our packaging most consumers are familiar with aseptic packaging for long life products such as long life milk, long life juices, tomato paste. We are also a leading producer of processing equipment, so we build entire infrastructure for the heat treatment, standardization, and manufacturing of food products, all of the plant automation. So basically, an end to end supplier for food producers in the Middle East. We've been operating this part of the world for almost 50 years. And obviously, since 2011 and, and further on uh, 2015, the operation in, in Yemen has, has been radically complicated and, and, and much more difficult to, to undertake than it was in the past. But I think by the end of the day and in close collaboration with our customers in Yemen, uh, we try to manage, but it's everyday management and every little detail can be a challenge that needs to be handled, such as supply chain management, etc. We know 
why aid agencies are in places like Yemen, but private companies would face challenges that uh, the same companies in in peaceful zones don't encounter. So why are you continuing to be there? What's the overarching sort of feel for what you do? We are put in the world to make food safe and available everywhere. We have uh, long-term partners in Yemen throughout 40 plus years. We keep supporting our customers during good times and and during difficult times. Obviously, we are taking care of our people. We take care of a lot of things in, in our business to run it sustainable. And during those years, it has been more difficult because we simply had to move a large part of our organization out of Yemen. But then we have enforced ourselves from the outside and we still have a handful of very good uh, local Yemenis on the ground that operate as good as they can. And as the situation changes, uh, you can say from day to day with great support from, from the teams outside. How many people in the country currently sort of rely on your products and the supplies that you provide? <laughs> uh, for liquid food, like evaporated milk, tomato paste, our business and our customers probably represent something in the range of 70-80% of what is produced. You can say consumers and people in, in Yemen are reliant on our efforts and not least the efforts of our customers. What are some of the key challenges that you face operating a business in this sort of environment? Yeah, if, if we try to imagine food factories being trapped in the conflict and also targets of or impacted by war, you know, with warehouses burning. And, and then, of course, it's a lot about supply chain management. Which route can you take into Yemen? Which border is open today? Is shipping an option? And c can we manage under the circumstances that it may cost much more than uh, road freight? Normally in supply chain, you, you plan for your manufacturing and it's a system, but here it's completely unpredictable. How much stock do you want to sit with? How long would it take you to, to bring it into Yemen? Sometimes we've been cut off for a for month. It's really, really difficult. And at times you consider one route, one border, one shipping line, even sometimes the bus to get a certain spare part. And then you, you hope that they make it through and they don't get stopped too many times. And uh, that is supply chain. But then we have uh, currencies fluctuating hundreds of percentages. We hand carry every decision we take. We follow everything we, we do all the way to our customers. But by the end of the day, uh, the fantastic work seen from my perspective is really the, the Yemenis and our Yemeni customers their resilience and their acceptance of the situation and finding practical solutions every day that is extremely admired seen from my uh, position. Have you been to the country? Yes, I have. But that was uh, before the war. Used to go, you can say, relatively frequently, several times a year to Yemen to meet our customers. So yes, I've been there. Is there anything that you can sort of Tell us about what you like about the country. I mean, you say the the people are resilient and, and I can only imagine how resilient they have to be. And Wonderful people, warm-hearted, long-term friends and partners. I mean, the, the level of hospitality, you would never come for a business meeting only. You would have a lunch with the entire company <laughs> uh, with everything uh, you can dream of and, and you would be hosted in the compounds of the customers and uh, some of my colleagues uh, do travel in under special circumstances. But that is my, my clear memory apart from a wonderful country. Niels Hugard, Managing Director at Tetra Pak Arabia, and before him, Mohamed Nabil Hayel Saeed of HSA Group. They were speaking to Nikki Rowe. 
Please subscribe to Radio Davos wherever you get your podcasts. Leave us a rating or review and join the conversation on the World Economic Forum Podcast Club. Look for that on Facebook. This episode of Radio Davos was presented by me, Robin Pomeroy, with reporting by Nikki Rowe. Editing was by Jerry Johansson. Studio production by Taz Kelleher. We'll be back next week, but for now, thanks to you for listening and goodbye.